This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon, and welcome to my talk on urban migration today. The world has experienced unprecedented urban growth in the recent decade. As much as three percent of Earth's landmass has been urbanized, an increase of at least fifty percent over previous estimates. Today, people living in cities already outnumber those in rural areas, and the trend does not appear to be reversing. In addition, cities have larger amounts of carbon consumption than rural areas. This is a result from two major aspects. First. With the increase of urban population around the world, the massive construction of urban infrastructure and residential housing is hard to avoid. Second, urban households have a higher rate of car ownership and use more gasoline products. Even though rural exodus is often negatively judged, there are also benefits of migration shared by the local environment and the society as a whole. Well, firstly, global trends of increasing urban migration and population urbanization can provide opportunities for nature conservations, particularly in regions where deforestation is driven by agriculture. As rural dwellers leave their homes, local forests are left to recover. What's more, it is easier for city dwellers to get around. Living in the country means transport can be very difficult. For instance, after midnight, there are no buses or taxis in the countryside. However, there is still a number of public transport modes to choose from in the city. Finally, with more funds and advanced technology, cities endeavour to produce clean energy. New power plants have been built to take harmful methane gas created by the decomposition of rubbish. And convert it into electricity. By doing so, an important greenhouse gas is turned into useful energy, rather than being directly emitted into the atmosphere. The hustle and bustle of city life offers women the opportunity to explore different professions and pursue their own careers. Women in cities work as engineers, managers, and even football players. This change of roles. Has affected their marital status and family life. More women are choosing their careers over marriage, which raises the graph of late marriages. As a result, more are remaining single well into their late thirties. They want to be independent and earn money on their own. It is also easier for them to get a promotion while working in the city. Women are slowly achieving wider participation at work. While in rural areas, the mindset is still very conservative. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, 
You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. However, cities also change the way that humans interact with each other and the environment, often causing multiple problems. In general, urban wages are significantly higher, so moving to the city is an opportunity to earn what was impossible in rural areas. However, the wage difference is often offset by the higher cost of living and absence of self-produced goods, including substance farming. A sizable proportion of new corners attach greater importance to money and gradually abandon their former way of life, thus risking losing their culture. These new city residents are also faced with another problem. According to statistics, crime rates are significantly higher in densely populated urban regions than in rural areas. For instance, property crime rates in our metropolitan areas are three to four times as high in comparison to the rates in rural communities. Immigrants upon arrival into cities typically move into the poor, blighted neighborhoods because that is where they can afford to live. Crime in these areas is high and reflects poor living conditions as these neighborhoods experience great levels of poverty. This pattern also occurs for violent crimes which is much more common in large urban areas than elsewhere. In addition, traffic congestion and industrial manufacturing are prominent features of the urban landscape which take their toll on the natural environment and those who depend on it. Air pollution from both cars and factory emissions affect the health of countless urban residents. Rural to urban migration can boost the urban economy. With a better economy, cities provide their residents with better welfare. But the concentration of services and facilities such as education, health and technology in urban areas inevitably contributes to greater energy consumption. Another problem with life in the city is traffic congestion. It makes people late to work and thus stresses us out before we even get there. Deliveries can't arrive on time, gas costs money, the quality of life of those commuters starts to decline. What's worse is that if congestion makes it harder to match the right workers to the best jobs, it is economically inefficient as well. That is the end of section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2 First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. 
Welcome to this introductory lecture on the geography of the United Kingdom. The UK, with a total population of over 60 million, consists of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Great Britain comprises England, Scotland and Wales. England is the largest country of the UK, with some 52 million people. It is mainly a lowland country, with some upland areas in the north and west. The capital is London with about 7 million people. There are many manufacturing industries, and farming is widespread, but the economy is increasingly service-based, and London is one of the world's leading centres for banking, insurance, and other financial services. High-tech industries have replaced many of the more traditional ones. In Scotland, 5 million people live in an area not much smaller than England. The country boasts vast open spaces and is one of the last areas of unspoiled natural beauty in Europe, featuring mountains, lochs, that is lakes, and glens, that is valleys. Modern industries including oil, electronics and biotechnology, as well as more traditional industries such as fishing and forestry, drive the economy. The largest city is Glasgow, but the capital is Edinburgh. Wales is home to three million people, and its geography is characterised by coastline, mountains and lakes. Cardiff is the capital and largest city. Key industries include electronics, auto components, food processing, healthcare and professional services. More Japanese companies have set up shop in Wales than anywhere else in Europe. About 1.6 million people live in Northern Ireland the capital of which is Belfast, the largest city. Residents enjoy beautiful countryside. Many new hotels are springing up to cater for increasing numbers of tourists and business travellers. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The climate in the UK is moderate. Summers are fairly cool and winters are quite mild. And despite what many foreigners believe, British weather is not rain and fog. It is actually more comfortable, more varied and more interesting than that. What you can look forward to in the way of rain, sun, temperature and even daylight depends on where you will be living. Here are some typical figures for London. January is the coldest month at 3 degrees centigrade, whilst July is the hottest at 17 degrees centigrade. Rainfall varies from 56 mm in April to 81 mm in December. Although the UK is quite small geographically, the climate varies from one area to another. In general, the west is wetter and milder than the east, and northern areas are noticeably cooler than southern ones. For example, compare the following temperatures with the London figures. Edinburgh, 14 degrees centigrade in July, and Manchester, 15 degrees centigrade in the same month. Edinburgh, 4 degrees centigrade in January, and Manchester, 5 degrees centigrade in the same month. Parts of Scotland usually get snow in winter, whereas you might live in London for several years without seeing a significant snowfall. International students who are used to tropical or equatorial climates are often intrigued by the sheer variety of the weather in the UK. Weather in the early spring tends to be especially changeable. You could be treated to rain, snow, thunder and lightning, hail and glorious spring sunshine, all in the course of a single day. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Right, Anna. I believe it's your turn to provide the research for the seminar today. You've been researching how marketing technology is changing how marketers use social media. Is that correct? That's right, yes. And what have you found out about how technology is being used in marketing? Well, with the first wave of this technology, Marketers wanted to see how they were performing, how to trend on social media, and then make decisions based on that. Right. And has that changed? Yes. Now it's much more complex. Marketers are managing multiple brands. There are many social networks to manage, and there is a lot of content to generate each day. The work marketers have to do on social media is huge. The technology is becoming more about using the data that really matters to play around with audiences, optimise content, see how people engage, and of course, optimise spending. When marketers have access to powerful data from social networks, in what smart, creative ways are they using that data to optimise in the areas you just mentioned? When you have data about an audience that engages with a brand, smart marketers want to know more about who those people are. For example, are there different personalities that prefer different product lines? They also want to know how personalities evolve over time to help them make decisions. Right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And the other area is content. What types of content are the most engaging and what actually influences the audience? If you're creating a campaign for a brand or product, it's important to know who you're speaking to, which users will be most engaged, and the users who will drive the success of this campaign. In the past, this was done by guesswork or agency studies but today it's almost happening in real time. Marketers can have a view of their audience almost immediately that allows them to make quick, smart decisions. Marketers are constantly searching for technologies that help them prove they're making the right decisions. Can you give an example of this? Sure. One big trend on social media is that the cost of paid content is rising, so marketers are adding tools that allow them to gauge how an advertisement has performed in terms of cost, reach, and audience engagement against total spend. Marketers want to know not only how they performed, but also whether they paid more or less than their competitors. Speaking of costs, what performance benchmarks are marketers using now for paid social, and will those change in the coming years? Marketers' first big focus at the moment is engagement. They see how content performs and what is gaining popularity. They also want to know whether their audience is going to their competitors or whether new brands are starting to win new customers. Great. Thanks for that, Anna. Now, let's move on. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4 First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Tonight I'm going to present an overview of the research on AMBER. OK, I'll start by giving a brief introduction about AMBER, then talk about the formation of AMBER, and then describe AMBER's applications in different fields. First of all, what is AMBER? AMBER is not a stone, but is ancient fossilized tree resin, which is the semi-solid amorphous organic substance secreted in pockets and canals through epithelial cells of the plant. And why is resin produced? Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, it is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury inflicted by insects and fungi. Amber occurs in a range of different colors. Besides the usual yellow, orange and brown, other uncommon colors are also associated with it. Interestingly, blue amber, the rarest Dominican amber, is highly sought after is only found in Santiago, Dominican Republic. There are several theories about what causes the blue color in amber. The most common one links it to the occurrence of volcanic dust that was present when the resin was first pressed out from Hymnaea Proterra millions of years ago. At this point, you might be curious about how amber is formed. Molecular polymerization resulting from high pressures and temperatures produced by overlying sediment transforms the resin first into copal. Sustained heat and pressure drives off terpenes and results in the formation of amber. Copal that I've just mentioned is also a tree resin, but it hasn't fully fossilized to amber. More generally, the term copal describes resinous substances in an intermediate stage of polymerization and hardening between gummier resins and amber. So where can we find amber? It can be found on seashores. The main producer worldwide is Russia. In fact, about 90% of the world's available amber is located in the Kaliningrad region of Russia, which is located on the Baltic. Here, the resin is washed up on the coast after being dislodged from the ocean floor by years of water and ocean currents. However, exposure to sunlight, rain, and temperate extremes tends to disintegrate resin. This also indicates that amber is not really an ideal fossil preservative for most uses. We've already learned that amber is made of tree resin. It often includes insects that were trapped within the tree many millions of years ago. A piece with a visible and well-arranged insect is generally valued much higher than simple, solid amber. One Dominican amber source reported finding a butterfly with a 5-inch wing spread. This is both a large and unusual find. 
and most butterfly specimens have no more than a two-inch wingspan. Inclusions in Dominican amber are numerous, one inclusion to every 100 pieces. Baltic amber contains approximately one inclusion to every 1,000 pieces. Now that you have a basic knowledge of amber, I'd like to talk a bit about amber's application in different fields. First, amber is appreciated for its color and beauty. Good quality amber is used to manufacture ornamental objects and jewelry. For instance, using a variety of exclusive, first-class quality natural Baltic amber with silver to make natural amber jewelry. But due to the biodegradation of amber fossils, people with amber jewelry have to take special care of it to ensure that the amber is not damaged. It was previously believed that amber worn on the neck served to protect one from diseases of the throat and preserved the sound mind. Calistrate, a famous doctor in the Roman Empire, wrote that amber powder mixed with honey cures throat, eye, and ear diseases, and if it is taken with water, eases stomachache. While the mystery around that use of amber has not been cleared, one thing is sure, it will help effectively to defeat small malaises. Amber has even been used as a building material. Amber created the altar in St. Brigida Church in Gdansk, Poland. In St. Petersburg, Russia, the walls of the famous Amber Room were lined with intricate carvings and inlaid designs. This palace room is being reconstructed from photographs and can be visited at the Catherine Palace, located in the town of Tsarkoya Selo. And finally, the fourth use of amber is that... That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.